a very good op- good evening to everyone a warm welcome to all of you to the first professor ch alexandrovich memorial lecture i am aman khare research assistant at mlu mumbai we are very pleased to have dr karl landor who will deliver today's lecture on ch alexandrovich india and the excavation of international law before we start with the lecture i would like to invite our guest of honor dr Manoj Kumar Sinha, sir, Director, Indian Law Institute and Vice President, Indian Society of International Law, for his welcome in this. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Aditya. <clears throat> Professor Carl Carl Landuel, Professor Dilip Ukre, Vice Chancellor, Maharashtra National Law University, respected Professor Benu Gopal, head of the department of Madras University, and all the participants. Mm-hmm. It's great honor and privilege for me personally that I have been part of this exercise. And uh, I thank uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor for giving me an opportunity. Uh, let me begin with <clears throat> about the journey of Professor Charles Henry Alexander Weech. He was a Polish British scholar and professor of the University of Madras and subsequently University of Sydney, which I will discuss a little bit later. In this context, like, you know, this is the initiative which uh, <clears throat> reminds me what Professor Abaxi has written in honor of Professor Alexander Weech. Uh, in 2019, the University of uh, National Law School Tamil Nadu, they also organized first, like, you know, memorial lecture. After that, nothing happened. So, but I'm happy that sir has taken initiative. So he said, and that is very interesting. Professor Baxi wrote, legal education and research in India seem to thrive more on massacre of ancestors more than massacre of ancestors than memory of ancestors so he wrote on that so we are more on massacres of ancestors so we hardly bother and we continue working on that particular thing uh, it's a uh, in a brief time what i'll see it's a great journey there's like you know personality what we have to learn from professor alexandrovich it's not like you know he is professor all of a sudden in fact, officially he became professor in 1951. So he started his journey from the like, you know, he passed his law degree from the Krakow University in Poland and he started practicing there. Initially, he had interest on canon law, canon law, and he started and gradually after the canon law, he has interest in the <clears throat> little bit like, you know, uh, uh, interest in history interest in history so he canon law and history and during the like you know second world second world war period he moved from the uh, poland and he entered in the uh, london he reached england and there he served as a chairman of london board of the national economic bank of poland so he was a chairman for many years Till until 1948, and subsequently he became also chairman of the European Central Inland Transport Organization in Britain. So he was not professor, but the same time, more or less, he was also invited by the bar by Lincoln's Inn. So he started practicing, and same time he started delivering lectures, delivering lectures to the University of London students. Post-war era, he developed interest in the, particularly in the field of international organization. So that was the time turning point, and he started develop because he served in the various international organization as a chairman. So he had uh, some practical experience, and then he got an opportunity. Uh, I think then vice chancellor of the Madras University personally took interest, and Modalia sir invited him there, and he served ten years period in India. In 10 years period, starting from the 1951 to 1961 in the Madras University. And you can consider the vision of uh, Professor Alexander, which is a Department of International Law and Constitutional Law. So it's not like exclusively international law, international law and constitutional law, which in 10 years period, he did a lot of things which I'm going to discuss one by uh, one by one. So his interest primarily was 
on the international organization international organization because he worked in the two three international organization and during that period he wrote couple of there are many articles he wrote but he wrote couple of books related to the international organizations particularly the law of global communications in the the, the, the law of uh, global communication in 1971 international economic organization in 1952 World Economic Agencies in 1962, and the lawmaking functions of specialized agencies of the UN in 1973. So these are the like you know, four or five works he did. Some work in India and some work before coming to India he did and completely. After appointment as a professor of law or head of the department of the Madras University, which he started, what he does he developed interest in the. Uh, history of international law. so we call him as a professor of history of international law so he developed interest in the historical aspect of the international law and he started exploring he is the first person if we consider like some people might have written but extensively he has written on the cotelia's earth Shastra. he is the first otherwise nobody would have known so he looked into that particular part and he explained in the cotelia's earth Shastra. during his time in india he was a also honorary legal advisor to the government of India and Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru con like, consulted him many times on that particular. A person who came to India without reading any Indian constitution in four or five years time. So the amount of work he has done, that is the message for all of us. 10 years he served in India and how the amount of work he has done, that is commendable. So first thing he started the constitution, learning the Indian constitution, and by 1957, he published a book that is the constitutional developments in India in 1956. So a scholar in six, seven years, he understood. He understood the Indian constitution in very, like, you know, like any other Indian scholars at that particular time. And he wrote a book on the constitutional development in, in the development in India. Then the another important, like, you know, if I see that his involvement in Indian scenario, there are three important development or three things he has done that can be measured in the Indian context. The first, he explored the history of international law. He explored the history of international law primarily in Asia. First, he started with Asia and gradually he moved to, moved to the African continent also. So what he, he has done, he has broken the notion of Western scholars coming after in India that international law is the like you know it owes its origin to western civilization so like you know, generally like western scholar they start from the gracious and jewelry tribal and other they say key so like you know contribution of the western scholars only civilized nation which professor anand very fondly say you know they say you know you can't learn asian african people have no idea about the international law and professor rp anand also like you know if i say in the modern time he used to attack and he said, you know, international law was very much in Indian civilization and it was found in the ancient time, modern time, medieval time and also in other time. It's not the Western. So we have actually taught. So he always argued on that. So Professor Alexander, which also strengthened, he was much before Professor Anand. So I give the credit to the Professor Alexander, which because he was much before Professor Anand. So he argued. The historical development of international law in Asian context, and he wrote many books and articles on that Indian perspective in there. In um, that is there. So first development approach history of international law, looking towards the prism of Asia and African continent. So more SEO pro Asian approach you can say on that particular time, and he also disproved that the claim which like Western scholars. Uh, prominently used to make that is a development of international law is a western uh, like you no know, civilization western contribution so he also attacked on that particular the second important journey which he has done in india that is starting with the very important publication and i'm happy that we have in the indian society of international law he started a landmark publication i believe that 10 to 12 volumes we have indian yearbook of international affairs this is a great like you know publications you can imagine in 1954 i believe it is started and for almost 10 or 11 years it continued and there's a rare publication 
the number of articles you will find number of scholars contributed is significant but unfortunately it's not available in all the library there's indian society of international library which i saw and there are number of articles which gives the different understanding of the international law if i look indian yearbook of international law that is the indian yearbook of international affairs unfortunately it did not continue for many years it won and the third development which he has done he founded grossian society of international law in sydney and which he was a chairman till his death he was there so after completing 60 like no 10 years he decided to go back to the australia and australia he joined this sydney university as a professor of professor of uh, international <laughs> international organization basically he is uh, uh, become a professor of international organization and there he served for another six years 1961 to 1967 he was there in the sydney university and then he took the retirement and he returned back to england for the remaining like you know another eight uh, eight years he died on the 26th uh, 26th i think uh, uh 26 september 1975 he died and he actually born on 13th October 1902. So almost 70 years, so 72 years he survived. And Alexander which also wrote a number of book, books when he was in India and later on also that is treaty and diplomatic relations between European and South Asian powers in the 17th and 18th century. So 17th is in South Asian powers in that like what the point which I, so he wrote in the diplomatic relations between the European and South Asian powers in the 17th and 18th centuries and also history and history of the law of nation in the east indies east indies 19 afro asian world and the law of nation and then european african confrontation in 1973 he was the professor who delivered also two hague lectures one in 1960 and 1968 after returning to london he served as a like you know he was the fellow of the cambridge university and then he continued to deliver lectures so his approach so the more historical historical way of looking in the international law that is the huge contribution which was not explored in that early era of the after the independence in indian scenario subsequently if i see there is a scope of professor rp anand who started in 1970-1980 onwards until 2000 he was the scholar of the international so he significantly also contributed on the same approach same line which was followed Professor Alexander, which once after leaving, I think uh, T.S. Rama Rao, he was a student, he started like, taking care of the center and then subsequently Balu, uh, then in between somebody else was, some professor was there, Balu sir was there and then uh, Ambrose and now Venu Gopal sir is there. So a great legacy. It's a heritage, what I see, the Madras University Department. And I'm very happy that uh, in future also Madras University will also take in your city what initiative has taken by the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Maharashtra National Law University. It's a unique, he thought about being a professor of domestic law, but he thought about how to recognize, not massacre of the like, you know, scholars, but to bring celebrate. So that is the way. And I hope this exercise will continue uh, regularly in the Maharashtra National Law University. So with this, I thank uh, all of you and particularly Honorable Vice Chancellor of the Maharashtra National Law University, Professor Dilip Ukesar, Benu Gopalji, and also Professor Karl for uh, hearing me presently for uh, uh, on the on the very important uh, scholar that Professor C.H. Alexander is. Over to you, uh, dear friend. I think Aman, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the words of wisdom. And I would like to invite our professor, Dr. Dilip Uke, Vice Chancellor, Maharashtra National University, Mumbai, for the presidential address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Raman. Thank you. Very good evening to all, and very good morning to Professor Carl, uh, Professor Carl Lander, uh, Professor Manoj Kumar Sinha, Professor Venugopal. My colleague and registrar, Dr. Anil Variyat, our young colleagues and energetic and enthusiastic uh, colleagues, uh, Mr. Raditya and Mr. Raman, and all the participants. It gives me an immense pleasure and uh, great satisfaction 
to be with all of you on this uh, really most satisfying and happiest occasion. The Maharashtra National University Mumbai, which was established just six years before, this is just a seventh year, wherein we impart uh, BAL honors, uh, five years degree course and uh, one year LLM course. Along with that, some uh, master's courses, unique courses like mediation and conflict resolution or uh, investment and security laws, LLM, likewise. But along with this, not only the imparting the regular courses and the knowledge amongst the students, what we want and what we intend to, that contribute in some way, to some extent, function of knowledge. And with this, uh, we have set up the Department of Research, the Center of Research, as well as advanced legal studies and uh, this youth these young researchers like mr aditya mr raman they have brought uh, the energy enthusiasm and dynamism in Maharashtra national law mumbai there are the series of activities which are being chalked out and planned like uh, colloquium in constant law about south asian countries the pg scholars uh, program summer school the research projects and so forth and uh, wherein uh, this uh, professor ch alexandrovich's memorial lecture series being launched i'm really happy to welcome professor carl who has accepted our invitation to be the keynote uh, speaker for today's uh, inaugural lecture series program there will be in total six uh, lectures in this lecture series. As Professor Manoj Kumar Sinha sir has pointed out, I do not wish to repeat the same thing, but nevertheless, I, I wish to also uh, mention a few things about Professor Alexander Vick, who has played a, a really phenomenal role in the development of international law in India. In 1951, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Madras, when decided to set up a, a new department of international law and constitutional law. The first such research department in India, Professor Alexander Wicks was chosen to lead it to head it. Where he explored the history of international law as pointed out by Professor Manish Kumar in Asia and founded the Indian Air Book of International Affairs. Over the decade, Alexander Wicks created, quote unquote, a Madras School of Law, which trained really uh, leading scholars of the field in India, as well as major Indian jurists and advocates. In that sense, his contribution is an immense, wherein he wrote widely on Indian law and constitutionalism and acted as an honorary legal advisor to the government of India and then Prime Minister, Mr. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. He was also associated with two of the authors of the Indian Constitution, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, as well as Allah Di Krishna Swami Ayyar, and along with Radha Bin, Radha Bin Pal, the dissenting Indian judge on the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal, all of whom were members of the Indian Committee of Comparative Law, which Alexander Wicks had initiated in 1953. Professor Alexander Wicks contributed to the effort of promoting the idea of international rule of law by rejecting a Eurocentric history and theory of international law. Hence, there is a need to bring his scholarship to the front as an alternative to the Eurocentricism in the history of international law. And there we believe that uh, this lecture is a small step and effort in this direction. We are extremely pleased to have Dr. Carl delivering the first lecture of this series. For researchers and scholars in international history, Dr. Carl is a very familiar name. He has written extensively about Professor Alexander Wicks and his role in advocating the 
is imprint on international law i had the opportunity to read his draft speech i must admire his intellectual commitment to bring in a very scholarly perspective about the works of professor alexander dwicks which all of you will thoroughly really enjoy and learn a lot from it i also take this opportunity to announce that for the upcoming lectures we have professor sonaraz from national university of singapore professor simon chesterman dean of national law university singapore professor david armitage from harvard university and many other such scholars from around the world who will speak to you in the coming few months and that's why the steps taken by us our young colleagues our young researcher as i said they have brought enthusiasm they have brought energy and dynamism which will really help scholars not only in this part scholars around the world so that the the scholarly work of people like professor alexander wicks not only will be known but rather that will be, that will be a kind of a guiding spirit for the scholars in the domain of international law with this i once again welcome professor karl professor vinay gopal and all others and i thank uh, professor karl for accepting our invitation i am really looking forward to listen to his scholarly uh, perspective about professor alexander wicks and his work thank you so much Hi, it's uh, Carl, and and thank you so much for the introductions and for the invitation, but also the uh, wonderful background, thorough background provided for um, Alexandrovich. So we've got really the good, a really good uh, basis to understand Alexandrovich in in terms that I would like to talk about him today. So thank you very much, and again, thanks for this wonderful invitation. So I'd like to start with the uh, nineteen. 80 issue of the Indian Yearbook of International Affairs. That's the journal, as was mentioned, that Alexandrovich initiated along the lines of the yearbook of world affairs he had seen in the United Kingdom. And he, he published papers. This uh, issue published papers presented at the Groshen Society, a society which Alexandrovich was the moving force in starting. And it was located in Alexandrovich's three successive homes, the UK, India and Australia. So they're, they're sort of located in three places all at once, but all of his homes. Um, and this year, 1980, published the papers uh, from the Groshen Society, one of which was Alexandrovich on the role of German treaty making in the partition of Africa. So this is 1980, five years after his death, as we've, as we've learned in 1975. Rama Rao has ta had taken over the editorship of the of the of the yearbook when Alexandrovich moved to Madras from Madras to Sydney and began the volume with his tribute to Alexandrovich. After talking about Alexandrovich's institutional and teaching roles, he turned to Alexandrovich's research, telling this, us that quote, coming with a background of studies in Western universities, the inadequacy of library resources in Madras especially in the area of modern international law, did not deter him. With uncanny skill, he spotted out and concentrated attention on the debates of the Indian Constituent Assembly in the areas of constitutional law and the unpublished archives of the record offices of Madras, Cochin, uh, and other places, which revealed to him a fund of material on the practice of international law from the 16th century onwards by the Indian rulers, end quote. And by the way, when I speak of uh, Madras throughout, since there are so many quotations, I will always use Madras instead of Chennai uh, so that we don't bounce back and forth. In, in, a sentence, Rao's, in a sentence, Rao makes it sound, sound like uh, an act of serendipity to find two of Alexandrovich's major areas of publication, Indian constitutional law and the history of international law. Indeed, in Alexandrovich's international reputation is as a historian of international law. He preferred the term, as many of you know, the law of nations. 
One can think of the 2017 publication of Essays on the Law of Nations, edited by David Armitage and Jennifer Pitts, as providing an immense boost to that part of his reputation as an early scholar of international law of the South. When I wrote about Alexandrovich, I turned to his major book on the Indian Constitution, Constitutional Developments in India of 1957, to underscore some of the values of his international legal history, such as the value he placed on secularism, commercialism, modernism, and the divisibility of sovereignty. In this lecture, I plan to go even deeper into the relationship between his writing on India and his writing on the law of nations, itself focusing so much on the Indian past. I'd like to begin by sketching Alexandrovich's image of the law of nations, including the importance of Catilia and Grotius, and then turn to his book on the Indian constitutional law, law to see values reflected in the, the law of nations writing, including those emblemized by Catilia and Grotius and embodied in the constitutional developments of India. In essence, where Cotillia, Grotius, B. R. Ambedkar, and Nehru meet. If Rama Rao told us that Alexandrovich made most of the available materials from that he could find in Madras, I'd like to fold two of Alexandrovich's major areas of scholarship together to talk about key values. Alexandrovich is largely known and criticized often for his the so-called Alexandrovich thesis, the argument regarding the influence of the law of nations of the East on developments of the West. However, rather than delve into the places where Alexandrovich spoke of the role of international legal of the role of the international legal orders impact on uh, of the East on the West, I would instead like to focus on the construction of the law of nations of the East, the framework he per perceived as prevalent in much of Asia. Here I'd like to focus on his 1967 book, An Introduction to the Law of Nations in the East Indies, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, which he previewed in his Hague lectures in 1960, and on an article on Cotillia that was published in the 1965-1966 uh, volume of the year, uh, British Yearbook of International Law. Alexander is known for his rise and fall narrative international law with a classic, and that's his word, writers of international law of late medieval and early modern uh, Europe, who held to a natural law theory of international law, which viewed all polities internationally as subject to the same universal legal norms. In his words, quote, which according to its natural law premises was a universal and non-discriminatory law operating irrespective of civilization, religion, race, or continent, end quote. And among the natural law writers of, the, of this period, Alexandrovich favored Hugo Grotius as the first among equals. I'd like to discuss Alexandrovich's Grotius before turning to, and you know, after talking about the Indian uh, uh, international legal past, before turning to the post-colonial India uh, and the values that were reflected in the Constitution. So I, that's the, the framing that I'd like to, to give. In his book on the East Indies, by which he meant India and what he called further India of Southeast Asia, he was talking essentially of a territory of Indian influence political order. And he wrote, quote, in the process of establishing their first settlements in India, the Portuguese, soon discovered their inability to deal with local communities on the basis of inapplicable legal titles, such as discovery, occupation, or the title of papal donation of overseas territories. All the major communities in India, as well as elsewhere in the East Indies were politically organized. They were governed by their sovereigns. They had their legal systems and lived according to centuries old cultural traditions, end quote. Furthermore, he wrote, quote, the Europeans were faced throughout the East Indies with similar institutions peculiar to the Hindu model of political organization. And it would perhaps be tempting to interpret the similarity by this similarity by reference to the widespread 
Brahman notions and traditions as originally embodied by Katilya's Arthasastra, end quote. With an aside about the potential nature of this observation, he then presses further, quote, be that as it may, some of the Cotillion tradition's tenets are discernible in interstate custom in the period of relations between European and East Indian powers and exercise their due influence on the shaping of those principles of law which were to govern their relations, end quote. To be clear about East -West, the East-West confrontation, Alexandrovich observes, quote, thus in the East Indies, a contribution of two worlds took place, the, a confrontation of two worlds took place on a footing of equality and the ensuing commercial and political transactions, far from being in a legal vacuum, were governed by the law of nations as adjusted to local interstate custom, end quote. If the interaction among states in Alexandrovich's East Indies looks to Cotillia, so does his view of the idea of sovereignty, where he points to the centrality of Cotillia's Arthasastra. Quote, the elements of sovereignty had been defined by Cotillia in his treatise Arthasastra, 4th century BC, he puts in parentheses, and rules of interstate dealing were laid down by him with a fair measure of precision, end quote. Here, Alexandrovich dates the Arthasastra to the fourth century BCE and others to the third century, which has long been, that's been, long been the traditional dating of the text. Over the years, there have been a good deal of uh, focus on the dating of the Arthasastra and whether there should be, should be viewed in terms of a unified authorship or whether there's serial changes. And there's this wonderful new book on the history of the Arthasastra by McClish that I think folks should look at. It's, it's really wonderful. It's interesting here to remember Cotillia's Arthasastra was rediscovered, as many of you know, in 1905 and announced by R. Shamasastri, the curator of the government Oriental Library in Mysore with uh, his Sanskrit publication in 1909, followed then by his English translation in 1915. The point here is the text so central to the culture of East Indies had disappeared. For Alexandrovich, not everything started with Cotillia and his principles carried on through replication by other authors. The Cotillian principles of sovereignty, he argued in his East Indies book, were the outcome of more ancient traditions and constituted at the same time, quote, a code of provisions from which usages and customary rules were derived during later periods, end quote. Alexandrovich would tell us about the demise of the Cotillion framework in the late 18th century and the early 19th century, but we're still confronted with the phenomenon of a vast spatiotemporal range of this Cotillion, uh, these Cotillion uh, principles with its key text missing from sight. In his article, Cotillion Principles and the Law of Nations, Alexandrovich, after making clear the European powers in the 16th through the 18th centuries were engaging in treaty relations on the basis of parity with Asian states, Alexandrovich observes that, quote, Cotillion Principles had an indirect impact on a number of European writers in the 18th century, end quote. Here, one of the articulations, this is one of the articulations of the Alexandrovich, it's Alexandrovich thesis. And he makes clear in a footnote that, quote, though of course they could not be familiar with Cotillia's work, the full text of which was discovered much later by Shamasastri, end quote. One could find in the Arathastra certain rules of war, for example, the prohibition of the use of poisonous and other objectionable weapons and the distinction between combatants and non-combatants and the like. Alexandrovich identifies these Cotillian principles as related to a much broader theme of the effort to eliminate anarchy, or in early Indian terms, the law of fish in interstate, uh, in the interstate Indian order. Quote, the uh, Cotillian's, Cotillian's objective was to propose a minimum of principles which would diminish the threat of anarchy, the law of fish, end quote. Key to managing the interstate legal order in early India was for Alexandrovich Katilia's view of the concept of mandala, essentially, which equates essentially and directly compared by Alexandrovich and others to the concept of the balance of power. 
Alexandrovich wanted to provide a portrait of the workings of the mandala. Quote, the classical model of this network is based on the concept of a circle of states, mandala he has in parentheses, that is to say a group of states linked together by their common affairs of peace and war, which found expression in bonds of alliance and neutrality or in hostility. In the center of the circle is a hypothetical ruler, an egocentric sovereign and would-be conqueror who envisaged the world around him as an area of expansion. He considers his immediate neighbors as enemies and the neighbors of his neighbors as friends, end quote. Indeed, for Alexandrovich, this seems to be a post-Vedic chessboard concept, which is not to be taken literally, but symbolizes the absence of an organization of states, the idea of balance of power, end quote. The main thing in the Cotillion regime is that states is a matter of practicality. This is what we're dissuaded from ravaging other states. This system kept the worst in check, finally as a matter of practical answer to anarchy, so that Alexandrovich talks of the workings of, quote, the concept of the mandala, whether in its cotillion or Machiavellian form, end quote. Indeed, it was common for many Indian writers to compare cotillion and uh, Machiavelli, uh, some using the Machiavellian moniker to suggest an immoral Machiavelli, but for Alexandrovich, we're really talking about the scientific rationality of both Machiavelli and Cotillia. The main thing here is that conquerors were kept in check. In East Indies, in his East Indies book, Alexandrovich is describing his Cotillian framework asserted, quote, in the course of the struggle, each ruler tended to get the upper hand in his circle of states, but defeated rulers were in principle not subject to debilatio or complete destruction. Defeat meant vassal states which victorious sovereign, which the victorious sovereign was bound to respect, end quote. So too, in his Cotillion Principles article, Alexandrovich wrote, quote, debilatio in the case of defeat would have been a provocation of the circle, which would have risen against the violator of this right. Cotillia states that the just conqueror is satisfied with the obeisance of obeisance of the defeated ruler, end quote. As he further explained, defeat meant vassal states, which the victorious sovereign was bound to respect if he wished to rise above all other sovereigns to the level of supreme suzerain, end quote. The principle of creating vassalage rather than complete conquer was central to Alexandrovich's portrait of this cotillion system. Indeed, for Alexandrovich, Alexandrovich, the slicing and dicing of sovereignty, which was central to his image of the Indian system of interpolity relations. For example, he wrote, quote, the history of the west coast of India is also illustrative of the kaleidoscope. I think that's a wonderful word of suzerain-vassal relations, end quote. Alexandrovich's view of the Indian state system as continuing, as a continuing ebb and flow among many states that never quite disappeared from the international order is, I think, quite important for him. It will tie, for example, into his critique of the cynical use of protectorates by European powers in Africa in his, in his book on the European-African confrontation and elsewhere where the protective status merely was a stepping stone, a veiled stepping stone to the full accession in a two-step process of just pure conquer. As suggested, Alexandrovich's Indian system has broad spatio-temporal reach and was adopted by the Mughal rulers. So they wrote, quote, the Rajput princes who preserved their dealings inter se and in their external relations the cust uh, and in their external relations, the customs of ancient Hindu polity exercised considerable influence on the Mughal emperors who acknowledged their separate existence as vassals of the empire. Indeed, over and over again, Alexandrovich describes the Mughal empire as subsumed by this Indian political ethos. He tells us the reign of Mughal emperors, Akbar, Behangir, 
and Shahadyan witnessed the victory of a secular policy of intergroup relations in India, no doubt under Hindu influence in conditions of decline of the jihad ideology, end quote. More broadly, Alexander Bridges saw jihad and canon law, and remember uh, from the introduction that he studied canon law, but here uh, he's thinking of canon law as, as meaning as imbibed with in, in, in temperate. He saw jihad and canon law as posing similar threats of religious driven conquest. However, in, European, in the European Asian confrontation in the East Indies, he described an increase of commerce between Christians and non Christians. The quote, common law prohibitions of treaty relations between Christian and non Christian powers became meaningless in the law of nations. And treaty making was allowed to gather momentum and quote. In this context, Alexander intoned what is his core values secularization. In describing the events of the European Asian confrontation and the rapid development of European East Indian trade, he noted, quote, there is every reason to believe that the increasing volume of treaties between powers of different region and cultural background contributed to the secularization. Here it's in italics, his italics, the secularization of treaty law as such, end quote. Indeed, Alexandrovich asserted, quote, while intensive treaty making had its impact on the evolution of the law and contributed to its secularization, the law itself served in many respects as an instrument of resistance to the deformation of certain ancient customs, such as those relating to the treatment of foreigners, capitulations, and the respect for the sovereign stat, uh, status of the ruler, the absence of the bellatio, end quote. In essence, Indian culture was one of commerce, secularization, and the divisibility of sovereignty, a commitment to Pakistan Sarvanda and intercultural and interreligious tolerance. I've mentioned that Alexander's narrative of international law focuses on the classic writers of the law of nations, followed by the 19th century rise of positivism, and then a 20th century uh, critique of positivism and a promise of reform, and that this is overly schematic. But that does not mean he didn't see anticipations of various stages. For example, he looks to Paulus Vladmiri in the early 15th century arguments for Polish, alli Polish alliance with non the non-Christian Lith Lithuania as anticipating Grotius's critique of the title of papal donation. So it is a common formulation for Alexandrovich when he writes in his article, Paulus Vladimiri and the Development and Doctrine of Coexistence of Christian Countries, that quote, 200 years later, Grotius questioned in the same way the validity of the bull intercatera of Alexander VI relating to the East and West Indies, end quote. And he sets up a contrast between Grotius and the Portuguese Freitas, unambiguously entitled Freitas versus Grotius, as if this were a match. Significantly, when Alexandrovich writes his squib in the American Journal of International Law on the Grotian Society, which he spearheaded, he observes, it was decided to call it the Grotian Society to give expression to the Grotian ideology with its equal emphasis on positivist and naturalist outlook. So he sees that sort of admixture in Grotius. We return uh, to return to the match between Freitas and Grotius. Alexandrovich focuses on Freitas's Portuguese framed assertion of the right of Christian rulers to wage war against non Christian rulers who hampered Christian, the Christian right to preach. Quote, a conclusion which Grotius disagreed, with which Grotius disagreed, though he accepted the principle of free access of Europeans to the East Indies for trading purposes, end quote. So acknowledge, we have to acknowledge Alexandrovich's strong conviction about the commitment to equality of nations by the classic writer. Still, his Grotius nevertheless recognized an avenue for waging war against non-Western polities, which uh, anticipated Tony Angie in his pivotal third world approaches to international 
Law or Twelve Book of 2004, Imperialism, Sovereignty, and the Making of International Law, in which his first chapter analyzes Victoria in a manner that would be applicable to Fidus and Grotius. Now, of course, Alexander Grotius, Grotius, you know, there is that reference to waging war, but mainly he's not, you know, the, you know, the Angie framing doesn't really fit. Quite different from Angie's take, Grotius points to Victoria, the subject of Angie's chapter, uh, with Grotius, as and the states that the two made the most outstanding contributions to the law of nations. End quote. Ultimately, it is the commercialism represented by Grotius, and related treaty making that gains centrality in, Gro in Alexander Grotius' story of the East-West confrontation. He observes, quote. With the rapid development of European East Indian trade in the 17th century, doctrinal obstacles to treaty making tended gradually to disappear. The canon law prohibitions of treaty relations between Christian and non-Christian powers became meaningless and the law of nations and treaty making was allowed to gather momentum. This is, there is every reason to believe that the increasing volume of treaties between powers of different re religion and cultural background contributed to the secularization, and secularization is italicized in this text, of treaty law as such, end quote. Alexandrovich's Grotius is very much part of the push to commercialism and secularization, secular, secularism, which are tied together. And I mentioned that Cotillia was very much a secular figure, uh, and Alexandrovich opined perhaps the strongest influence of the Cotillian tradition revealed itself in the trend towards the secularization of the law of nations in the Hindu sphere of influence in the East Indies, end quote. The two sides of the European East Indies confrontation had their effluence in commercial secular traditions best reflected by Cotillia and Grotius. Having framed the key values of Alexandrovich in the context of his approach to the Cotillian frame of interstatal relations in India and mentioning the Highlighting the figure of Hugo Grotius, I'd like to turn to Alexandrovich and the Indian Constitution. And by the way, and I should also mention that in 1958, he also published a bibliography of Indian law. So that's in addition to the Indian Constitution book of 1957. He was brought to India, as uh, we learned in the introduction, to create the first Indian program in international and constitutional law. The approaches to Alexandrovich are mainly as the historian of international law and the key writers on the Indian Constitution, both those who talk to him about, talk about his him as a historian of international law and the key writers on the Indian Constitution do not seem to deal with Alexander the Alexanders who published the Constitutional Developments in India Law Book uh, in uh, 1957, a decade before his East Indies book. Of course, during the 1950s, he was writing key articles on uh, East Indies uh, uh, interstatal law, for example, uh, in, in the in the yearbook. The exception is a reference to his weighing in. So the exception to sort of not talking about that book or his uh, his talk about his work on the constitutional developments uh, uh, in India. The uh, is the. Um, this is weighing in on the debate uh, of whether India, under its constitution, created a quasi-federal system. The one article related to the Indian constitution or Indian law that made its way into the Armitage Pitts collection on the law of nations is Alexandrovich's 1954 article, Is India a Federation? That's due, as one can imagine, and I uh, received uh, confirmation by both of the editors, that it was because of Alexandrovich's Treaty of Sovereignty, the whole question of how uh, sovereignty can be split up or analyzed. Looking at the recent scholarship on the Indian Constitution, Madhav Kozla's India's Founding Moment references Alexandrovich only in the context of this federalism debate. If we turn to Alexandrovich's Constitution book, its longest chapter may have been on the federalism question. But, you know, in the book, more broadly, there are chapters and he focuses on key elements like personal liberty and preventive detention, fundamental rights, the separation of powers, elections, 
not surprisingly, India and the family of nations. And that's a selection. There are other chapters as well. We learned from Rama Rao tribute in 1980 that I mentioned earlier. And Rama Rao was, as mentioned, his student, his research assistant, and his colleagues throughout Alexandrovich's time in India. We learned from that tribute that Alexandrovich was an honorary legal advisor to the government of India and had developed close relations with Prime Minister Nehru. From Armitage and Pitts, we learn of Alexandrovich's relationship with key members of the Constituent Assembly, B.R. Ambedkar, Aladi, Krishna Swami Ayer, and later, who later lived in, uh, the latter who later, who lived in Madras, and directly, was directly acknowledged by Alexandrovich in the Constitution book. The major argument of the book is taking Indian judges to task over whether they should look to the debates of the Constituent Assembly in interpreting the Constitution. Ecumenically, he asserts both in the conclusion and in the introduction that the main requirement is consistency. But of course, we know better. With the close reading, his close reading of the Constituent Assembly debates and his discussions with uh, Ambedkar, Ayer, and others, we know where it is going. Obviously, he would like the judiciary to pay closer attention to the debates themselves. That would have made certain clarificatory constitutional amendments that were made to the Constitution in the early 50s unnecessary. But one of the most interesting aspects of the book is that it was very much a study not just of the Constitution adopted in 1949, but developments in the years following. Quote, problems of Constitution making and issues arising in the course of constitutional practice are intimately interwoven, and it seemed appropriate, therefore, to attempt an integrated discussion of the two processes, one prior to and the other following the commencement of the Constitution on 26 January 1950, end quote. And he opens evocatively, this is the beginning of his introduction. The other statement is in the preface. A new Constitution, like a score of a new orchestral work, cannot be understood by reading alone, but waits for performance through concerted action, end quote. As a result, we are brought, despite Alexandrovich's careful prose style, into the midst of politically charged, policy-rich years of Nehru's first government. In his chapter on personal liberty and, the, and preventive detention, he begins by highlighting prolonged discussion of one of the most controversial subjects of the Constitution. After reference, Alexandrovich, after referencing the Constituent Assembly's substitution of the words, except according to procedure established by law, so that's the qualification which uh, replaced early discussions about without due process of law, which would have followed uh, the US example, he analyzes the Preventive Dis uh, Detention Act 4 of 1950. And he's not shy in criticizing the act's prohibition of detained purpose, uh, persons disclosing that they were not allowed to disclose to courts the grounds of their detention. Quote, it is difficult to imagine what the legislators had in mind in enacting such an absurd prohibition, end quote. The Indian Supreme Court was unable to act under Article 21, so that's not justiciable, but able to act under the procedural provisions of Article 22. And here I'm talking to Everyone who's listening uh, knows much more about this than I do. But significantly, Alexander Vidis wrote, preventive detention is to a great extent connected with the growth of undisciplined movements and parties, which are disturbing a disturbing factor in Indian political life, end quote. So here we're not merely involved in an academic exercise. Alexandrovich seems to recognize the challenges facing Nehru's government, very much seeing the scene. After stating that it was, quote, one of the paradoxes of Gopalan's, of the, in Gopalan's case, that the petitioner, a leading communist politician in India, fought at the same time for the cause of personal liberty and for the cause of his party, Alexandrovich ends his chapter with a wink. Quote, he mentions that the Home Minister presenting for, uh, for extension of the act in 1954, despite the court's rulings, quote, made it clear that the government's the government treats the act mainly as an effective measure of psychological, so it could be knocked down, psychological importance in the fight against subversive activities all over the country, end quote. 
Alexandrovich closes then with a inst instrumentalism that is far from the hyper academic analysis we might have thought we'd expect from Alexandrovich. One of the key themes of Alexandrovich's constitution is the place of religion in Indian society, focusing on the efforts to address caste in the constitution. He drew comparisons with the well known Jim Crow laws of the United States and asserted that India's problems are different from those of the United States. In India, the problems of classification, quote, are directly or indirectly connected with a religious tradition, end quote. Rama Rao attributes Alexandrovich with coining the term protective discrimination to capture the Constitution's effort to address inequity. But as I mentioned, Alexandrovich saw those efforts as working against religion. In addressing freedom of religion, he quoted Ambedkar's words to the effect, to the effect that, and so this is Ambedkar, the religious conceptions of this country are so vast that they cover every aspect of life from birth to death. There's nothing which is not religion. And if personal law is to be saved, I am not sure it, about it, that in social matters, we come to a standstill, end quote. Basically, Ambedkar's concern was how broadly religious protections would be covered in constitutional law and recognized by the courts. After discussing the various treatments as to whether courts should recognize religion only as a belief or more broadly as practice, Alexandrovich observed, quote, whatever the legal definition of religion is adopted by the courts, India is a country where religion still occupies a predominant position among the masses, end quote. So here's this uh, elitist reference to masses, but I'd like to underscore the word still in the sentence, which suggests linear progress out of benighted religiosity. Consequently, quote, the significance of this reality made the government much more cautious in the matter of the United Hindu Code than Dr. Embedkar, its promoter, wished it to be, end quote. Alexandrovich concludes his treatment of religion and constitutional law by stating, there are two ways of adapting religion to modern conditions and of bringing a progressive secular state into being. One is applied by Kemal Pasha, who modernized Turkey by the adoption of drastic methods of social reform. The other by gradual evolution. The prime minister and the government of India advocate the second way and neither legislators nor judges have disagreed with the, with the solution, end quote. If this reads as softly, a softly worded endorsement of an evolutionary approach adopted by the Indian legislature and judiciary, the unmistakable proposition is setting off religion as antagonistic to social reform and progress. We've already seen Alexandrovich's history of the law of nations, that his heroic figures stand up against religious justifications for war, whether driven as he intones repeatedly by one of his twin canon law and or jihad. Secularism, the secularism of the Cotillian tradition and the secularism of Hugo Grotius tie to his views of the state of post-colonial India, its progress and modernization meant secularization. Dianesh uh, Kadeza, in his book on 1950s India, this is a, a new book, tells us that Nehru made the struggle between communal and secular forces the central issue of his 1952 uh, election campaigns. And he also used the campaign to criticize Hindu con traditionalists who are delaying the enactment of the Hindu Code Bill. Nehru, whose position was not as strident as Ambedkar's, had long been a secularist. And his secularism, setting him aside from some of the Hindu strains of Gandhiism, was of a piece with the secularist product progress vision of Alexandrovich. In his constitution book, Alexandrovich also narrates the career of constitutional provisions regarding compensation for deprivations of property, what in, in the US we call takings. Just in the 1950, just in 1950, Alexandrovich tells us judges of the Supreme Court in state of West Bengal versus Mrs. B. Banerjee, quote, did not discern them, did not concern themselves with the absence of the words just or adequate compensation in Article 31 2, which had been deliberately in italics omitted by the Constituent Assembly from the article. So they read uh, just or adequate into the constitutional provision. Alexandrovich further explains. It was, Prime, it was Prime Minister Nehru who introduced the article in the assembly 
and expressed the view of the majority of the assembly when he declared that the term compensation by itself could not mean just or adequate compensation, end quote. The reform mistakes here are clear. Mr. Nehru's and the Congress party's anxiety about the success of the agrarian reform, as well as the entirety of measures promoting social and economic reform in India found its forceful exp expression in his belief that Congress is pledged to see these reforms through as otherwise they would not come by law, end quote. And here, Alexandrovich ominously uh, puts come, by, not, come not by law in italics. So, you know, the obvious practical approach is through reform. As a result of ju the judicial interpretation of the judges implying just and adequate into the con 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 constitutional text, the text needed to be amended. And Alexander Bruce explains that, quote, the first amendment of Article 31 relating to deprivation of property was enacted in order to make the land reform a definite success, end quote. Alexandrovich's, Alexandrovich's Nehru, quote, spoke about the revolutionary, the revolutionary aspect of land reform and that Congress was, quote, pledged to the abolition of the feudal zamindari system, end quote. Among the early amendments was one to clarify the state restrictions on the right to free association, which were immune from ultra virus claims in cases relating to quote the and this is the, uh, the 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 amendment text the carrying on by the state or by a corporation owned or controlled by the state of any trade business industry or service whether to the exclusion complete or partial of citizens or otherwise end quote clearly these are integral to the government's larger economic reform and development efforts regarding the elimination of judicial review in the amendment of article 19 alexander uh, was quite clear that the amendment represented, quote, giving the government more freedom in interfering in the economic life of the country and in promoting the welfare state, end quote. And back to the point of compensation for land reform, he quoted his often interlocutor in Madras, quote, Sir Aliadi made this remarkable statement. Our ancestors never regarded the institution of property as an end in itself. Property exists for Dharma, Dharma is the law of social well-being. Capitalism is alien to the root idea of our civilization, end quote. On the first page of, the, of Alexandrovich's chapter on directive principles of state policy, he started, Sir Ivor Jennings described them as Fabian socialism without the socialism. And here, Alexandrovich states, and here it's in a footnote, in, and it's also in passive voice, which is common for Alexandrovich. However, it may be noted that recent trends follow increasingly the socialist pattern, end quote. Mitty Mukherjee, in her wonderful book on the underlying political values of India, India in the Shadows of Empire, tells of two competing visions of justice, justice of, as freedom and justice as equity. For her, the dominating vision of justice, justice as equity, comes from a colonial framing of justice deriving from the benevolence of the monarch as equity. In that framework, imperial justice was, quote, tied not to the universality of law, natural or common, but the notion of equity grounded in the personal direction and compassion of the imperial monarch, end quote. That framework did not disappear for her with independence. Notably, she says, the preamble of the Indian constitution clearly institutes justice rather than freedom or individual rights as its foundational and over-determining category, bringing the social, the economic, and the political domains within its jurisdiction, end quote. Indeed, the sovereignty of the concept of justice as equity in the Indian constitution is invested in its authority to override fundamental rights or individual rights, grounded as they are in the notion of freedom, the very bedrock of modern democracy, end quote. On the role of socialism, Mukherjee writes that, quote, the reason for Congress leadership's att attraction to the general ideological socialism, general ideological socialism, is not far to seek. There are large areas of compatibility between the notion of justice as equity 
and the idea of socialism. Most importantly, that both are directed at sub substantive equality as opposed to the formal or abstract equality under law promised by democratic politics, end quote. If we think of the various forces and influences at play in the Indian Constitution, clearly there is a strong sense of the con continuity of the colonial past. If we think of the uh, constitutional moment, one can think of India's own cultural past referenced by a year above, as well as Ambedkar's learnings from the uh, US scholar uh, John Dewey identified by Madhav Kozla in his book, and so many of Midnight, Midnight Parents who studied, for example, with Harold Lasky in London. Reading Alexander Vinge's constitution book, it's clearly quite sympathetic to the welfare state. And as you know, as I mentioned, he specifically uses the term welfare state designed by Nehru. We can see in, the historic, in his historical work on the law of nations, his strong commitment to secularism, progress, and modernization. We should remember that he took up a role in London, as we, we learned in the introduction, before he came to India as chairman of the London Board of the National Economic Bank of Poland and the chairman up to 1948 of the European Central Inland Transport Organization. And that's an important organization as a uh, um, uh, early predecessor to other organizations, which is to say that Alexandrovich was deeply involved in planning post-war post -war rebuilding of both his native Poland and Europe more generally. In conclusion to it, in his conclusion to his international organizations in 1952, and as mentioned, he published one uh, in 1952 and a later book in 1962 with a similar title, but it's, uh, uh, it's World Organization. Alexandrovich writes, so this is 1952. After the First World War, state interference appeared in various parts of the world. Such diversity proved to be construct a constructive factor as increased planning and state interference in underdeveloped countries made possible their speedier industrialization with the help from capital from surplus countries. Some underdeveloped countries have, however, applied excessive planning, which has led to isolation, isolation and deprived them of the support of foreign capital and equipment, end quote. Here it's clear that, quote, state interference beyond a certain point ceases to be a constructive element in underdeveloped countries, end quote. Indeed, and here we know, we, we find out what he's talking about, the overplanned economies of East Europe must now rely on their own insufficient resources and capital accumulation. So again, this is 1952 and he's looking to East Europe. Basically, Alexandrovich endorses a balance approach, quote, the world economic development and balance is promoted by such relationships between public and private elements in various parts of the world, which through which though divergent are interrelated in a con constructive way, end quote, end quote. But let's remember that Alexandrovich's vision for international economic organizations themselves is quote, a realization of common planning and its ultimate contribution to peace, end quote. The conclusion helps gauge his sympathetic prose about India's developmentalism. Armitage and Pitts suggested or, or wrote in uh, that Alexandrovich, and so this is the introduction to their collection, that Alexandrovich always, quote, always avoided the still novel term third world coined in 1952, a non-aligned movement from 1961 to describe the blocks of states that most captured his attention, and he never discussed the Bandung Conference of Asian and African nations that met in Indonesia in April 1955, end quote. Nevertheless, the concept of non-alignment found its way much earlier in Nehru's statements, such as his speech in, uh, on All India Radio in 1946, when he announced, quote, we propose as far as possible to keep away from power politics of groups aligned against one another, end quote. And non-alignment finds his way into Alexandrovich's constitution book. He talks about the international provisions of the constitution and suggests that, quote, they may determine the standard of action taken by the legislature or executive and certainly embody the views of the majority of the constituent assembly, which found their fullest expression in the present policy of non-alignment, the present policy of non-alignment 
and international mediation pursued by India, end quote. So that's 1957 looking back into the 50s. That in fact suggests a more focused reading of the final words of this constitution book, that it quote, it is obvious from the development of India's democratic institutions that she belongs to the brotherhood of nations which arrived to make the rule of law prevail over the rule of force, end quote. So that seems like pablum, but he, we should especially look that he pre prefaces those, those words with a reference to this being a period of highest tension in power politics. So the law prevail over the rule of force is in this period of highest tension of power politics. So what I've tried to do today is to talk further about Alexander Bauer values expressed by both his history of the law of nations and his constitutional, uh, India constitutional work and put them together and look at them together to see how they uh, may give us light on, on, on each other. So that's it, so thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Carl. Uh, it was indeed wonderful to uh, listen to you. And uh, before we move ahead, uh, we have a very special guest. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jennifer Pitts. Uh, she's a professor of political science at uh, University of Chicago. And uh, she's very special to this lecture, mainly because she wrote, uh, she was a co-editor of the uh, seminal work, uh, The Law of Nations in Global History, wherein she has actually tried to rehabilitate uh, the works of Alexander Witch and tried to mainstream it. So, uh, the invitation to uh, give a bit of uh, bit of uh, her perspective into the lecture. Uh, so, ma'am, I'm passing over the privileges to you. Thank you so much for the, the warm welcome and, and thanks to Carl for the wonderful lecture. Um, the impromptu intervention, I'm expecting to, to do this, but I, a couple of questions formed in my mind as, um, as Carl was speaking. Um, and so I'll, I'll raise them. What I, I have to apologize. Also, I've been having a very choppy reception, so I didn't, I wasn't able to hear everything in the lecture, especially toward the end. And I'm not sure that you're getting a smooth reception from me now. Is, is it okay? Or is it broken up? It's okay. It just started broken, being broken up, but it's fine. Okay. Um, so thanks Carl for the wonderful lecture. The, the 1st set of questions has to do with, um, uh, uh, an issue that has preoccupied me about Alexandrovich's Law of Nations writing, which has to do with the relationship between his normative aims as um, somebody working for the inclusion of India in particular and other post-colonial states in the international order, in the post-war international order, the relationship between that kind of normative and practical agenda and his historical work. And I wonder what your thoughts about that are. So it, one could argue that his reading of Grotius, for instance, is a um, set of normative resources that can be then deployed in the, um, in the contemporary legal moment. Um, and this is related, I think, to an innate that has emerged um, in, uh, among historians of international law in the last couple of years. Um, most notably in the new book by Ann Orford uh, about um, about how lawyers do history versus how historians do history. Um, so the, uh, the kind of historian's critique might be that Alexandrovich offered a partial reading of Grotius with a particular normative thrust, which is to say he wanted a usable past that would show that there had been a lot more um, mutuality between Europe and uh, and into the Mughal Empire and other states that Europe had been much more receptive to that, and that there had been what he calls a century of the norm. The norm was the. Wonder what you what you think about that, um, and about maybe this broader question: how lawyers um, mobilize history for um, for conservative or, or um, kind of contemporary ends. Um, and then the second question that I had um, was about the latter half of your talk in a really interesting 1952 P discussed, which I, um, it, it's not a piece that's familiar to me, but if I understood correctly, it looks like much more receptive to 
um, the intervention of Western capital in the economies of post-colonial states than you might have expected from the later Alexander, but who particularly 70s um, is very worried about um, about the dominance of Western powers and and you know thinking about how to use the General Assembly in the UN um, to push back against that kind of dominance. So is that a fair reading? And if so, do you see an evolution part by way of his what he learned in the 50s in, in his time at the University of Madras? Or would you put another reading on what's relationship? So, so thanks again all, very much okay. for the great lecture. Yeah, so well, thank you for those questions. So first of all, as um, the whole reason for bringing the uh, Indian Constitution law book and the law of uh, his history of the law of nations work together is that they're both very much freighted with certain values. And so I liked I was I wanted to them to sort of bounce off each other to talk about the importance he placed on things like secularization, et cetera. Uh, modernization, commercialism. Remember, he's very much involved in a commercial world. So, if you, um, so, uh, so those are very important values for him. And so, I was trying to sort of like work through his values, which that that's what his, you know, as precise and careful a historian is. He does have messages, obviously, we all do. But his, you know, I, I wanted to sort of like bring them out. You know, some of them are very clear. I mean, certainly his. African um, uh, European African confrontation book is, you know, clearly a, 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 an intense critique of a legal system that had been ripped away from uh, from its commitments to law, um, and you know, so that this protective uh, the protective um, the, you know the the protectorates were were merely a sort of a you know. A thin veil for you know sheer uh, you know sheer uh, acquisition and conquer. Um, so too you know all of his analysis about his the classic law law writers etc. Those are, you know very very it's very clear where his uh, where his sympathies lie and how those are impacted in the you know in the contemporary world. Going to his international organizations. So he was deeply involved and I, I would want, like to look at this more. There are two books. So one was 1952 and then there's one in 19, uh, there's a whole bunch of articles, but 19, he, he revised it as a new book in 1962. But, you know, the 1952 book, it was suggested to, to him by George Schwarzenberger to write this. And he had been involved in all these international organizations and he had been involved in so a lot, but if you read the book, there are all these pieces where he talks about um, various international, earlier international organizations, postal union, et cetera. But interestingly enough, there are lots of things about the importance of certain um, organizations, you know, that are around uh, around certain uh, commodities like copper or whatever, and the the importance of those, you know, coal or whatever and uh, sugar and so it's interesting and in there as you go you know there are there's lots of interest in the importance of the uh central banks uh and how they play and how they work with each other and so he you know here he is someone who actually worked for a cent the central bank uh, you know ran the central bank for for poland in exile right uh and the other thing is he's very much a proponent for John Maynard Keynes in his critique in the creation of Bretton Woods with white, you know, the American white. Uh, so, uh, you know, John Maynard Keynes, he talks about his proposition. I mean, I'd like to in, be interested to see how much more he gets from Keynes. I mean, one of the things that I mentioned in my work, when, which you've probably seen as well, is he mentions other figures a lot less in his notes than you might think other scholars, et cetera. So one, even though he knew everybody, and everybody knew him, and he's published everywhere, uh, though you know his footnotes and his his texts are not, are not that clear about where where he where he, other scholars and other figures lie. But the figure of John Maynard Keynes, it would be interesting whether it's just that or whether he gets more from John Maynard Keynes. So anyway, uh, 
I think he's not one of the things is he's deeply involved. There might be uh, a move towards um, his his worries about his his need for the new states in the seventies to um, to be uh, to to have their views expressed as international law through the general assembly. Uh, so he he writes about the new states in the seventies. But I don't think, you know, and one has to think of his early books, you know, he was in that world. He, that was his world as being uh, in international organ economic organization. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, I think that that frames that piece. Jennifer, does that uh, help you with the um, with the answer to your question? I'm so sorry, Carl, but the reception was very bad for big chunks of, of your response. So I was not actually. Um, able to hear, especially your response on 1952. So I really apologize. I hope that it was helpful. Did, did, for, uh, did, I, did others hear that, or am I choppy elsewhere? Uh, so we could hear it. I think uh, there was an network issue on uh, Professor Jennifer's side. Okay. Uh, okay. Ma'am, uh, so we'll be uploading the video on the uh, on our YouTube channel, and uh, I'll be happy to share it with you. Uh, is it okay? Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, 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 Dr. Carl, if if I can have a small uh, intervention, and I have a small question. Uh, is it okay? Uh, yeah. So, uh, as as in your papers, you have uh, in both of your papers, you have explicitly written about uh, Alexandrovich, and I I fondly remember you you talking about uh, Rama Rao's words on Alexandrovich, wherein he said that uh, Afro Asia cannot actually forget the juristic contribution of Alexandrovich, uh, and 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 several other scholars, including R P Anand or Angie, has again and again reiterated the importance of Alexandrovich in. Uh, rewriting uh, the international law in in that in that essence, and to provide a, a non-European approach to law. But what we see is that Alexandrovich is talked about a lot, but uh, referred uh, very very less. You know, uh, before Gen uh, Professor Jennifer Jennifer and uh, Professor David's intervention, Alexandrovich was hardly mentioned and cited by Indian authors. So, do you think it is because of his uh, deterrence towards uh, the word third world, or do you think that because of a disassociation to use the term third world, that Indian scholars or scholars from South Asia have disassociated with uh, Alexandrovich works and and citing him or bringing him into for, uh, into the front run of uh, international law writing or history in India? Yeah, so thank you for that question. First of all, I think Alexandrovich is not as major a figure. He's mentioned by people. He's taken you know, as sort of like the treaty guy here, or he's mentioned there, but he's not seen as a major figure. And I think his, uh, you know, I think with Jennifer and David's new collection, I think there's a reinvestment in Alexandrovich as a figure. Um, for Tony Angie, for example, although there is, you know, Angie in some ways comes from Alexandrovich, what he, his main, Discussion of Alexandrovich, and one place he he discusses Alexandrovich is a critique of Alexandrovich for having this, you know, you know, for his views of the classic writers. So, for Angie, the you know, Alexandrovich is you know sees these classic writers as uh, you know as a very positive heroic vision of these classic writers. And an email to me. Um, uh, Tony said, you know, said Alexandrovich had a romantic view of uh, these romantic writers. So that's, you know, if you think of the first chapter of Angie's book that's on Victoria, Victoria is a uh, is a figure who allows for war against, you know, against the uh, native populations of the Americas. He allows for it, even though. He is seen as someone who talks about the importance of their their government, et cetera, their uh, you know the rights they have. Still, he creates a uh, an avenue for war, and it is that which is built into the law of nations or international law for Tony Angie, and it's part of the DNA of international law. So, Tony Angie sees Alexandrovich as on the other side of this, as heroizing the uh, the classic writers. And for Alexandrovich, the Angie style uh, imprint only comes with the positivist uh, 
uh, reign of the 19th century. And so there, and so the, basically Alexandrovich was not that, was not that big a figure. And I don't think that uh, Indian scholars would have been racing to read him more, you know, or sort of like somehow uh, ignoring him more than Western scholars. I don't think that's the case. I found it interesting that his, I, his Indian constitution book seems to have disappeared from my perspective. And so I thought it would be interesting to sort of bring that back and, you know, uh, it's this, you know, 1957 work, uh, which is very much in its context, but also speaking to its context. I thought that would be interesting in terms of how one reads Alexandrovich uh, and, you know, how they work together, because here he was the first professor of international and constitutional law. So, um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, yes. I'm an overview. I think you have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Adit. It is symbolic to have the representation of Department of Legal Studies, University of Madras in the lecture. Since the department is a brainchild of Professor Alexandrovich, I would like to invite our guest of honor, Professor B. Venu Gopal, Head Department of Legal Studies, University of Madras for the concluding address. Over to you, sir. Thank you. My sincere thanks to so we can't hear you properly. Now, so it's a little louder. Uh, okay, it's a great pitch for me talk about my department and my preceder and my ancestor Alexander. Men may come and may go, but the Alexander department is going to do this. Because uh, when I, after I hear the lectures given by Professor Carl, I think that Dr. Carl is the right person to talk about the Alexander. As a head of the Department of Legal Studies, and Dr. Call rightly pointed out, we don't have some books written by Dr. Alexander Rich in our library. There, that is the condition. And uh, I'm always grateful to the Vice Chancellor of uh, Maharashtra National Law University, Professor Dilip, to extend uh, such a warm for me. Like, uh, professors like uh, Manoj Kumar Sinha, director. Indian drawings as well as the Professor Hall. And uh, as a head of the Department of the Department of Legal it's my pleasure to share some uh, news about uh, Dr. Alexander. Dr. Alexander is a police by descent, but an Australian by citizenship until 1919. Alexander Wish was a member of suppressed nationality. A part of nation without the state claim continued and identity under the protection of the multi ethnic empire. This history of empire and multiple claims of the jurisdiction reflected his concerns long after he had moved from Galicia to Tamil Nadu. So Alexander was called the war at the Lincolns uh, in January 1940 and took British citizenship in January 1950. While in practice as barrister, he lectured part-time on law. So we can hear you. Yes, and international relationship at the University of London. But a new opportunity soon appeared that would decisively reorient intellectual Trajectory towards South Asia and the post colonial world. When in 1951, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Madras, Rakshmi Tamil Magaliar, 
decided to set up a new department of international law and conflict law. The first research department in India, the Alexander Wish, was chosen to lead it on the recommendation of his former teacher, David Haggis Harry, the director of the University of London. So I wanted to give, mention here that when the then the vice chancellor of uh, University of Madras, who decided to invite uh, Alexander to head the department, at the time, he wrote a letter to the government of Tamil Nadu and saying that uh, salary to Alexander Ravis was twice the salary of the vice chancellor was paid at the time. And uh, that kind of a reputation was given by the Lakshma uh, Samai Madhuliyar to Alexander Ravis because of his uh, ability and his uh, uh, depth towards the international law. So Alexander Ravis soon became a pivotal figure on the rapidly growing world of legal education and a scholarship. This was a moment just after independence in 1947, soon after the new Indian constitution and came into effect in 1950, when the Indian legal academy was in need of reform and when the expertise of European and American lawyers were not inevitably associated with the former colonial power was in particular demand. On this day, I am very proud to say that I am a part of the department started by Alexander Ravis. Over a course of decade, the Alexander Ravis created a Madras School of Law, which trained leading scholars of the field in India, as well as the major Indian jurists and advocates. He wrote widely on Indian law and constitutionalism and acted as an honorary legal advisor to the government of Tamil Nadu and to the Prime Minister Nehru. He associated with uh, two of the authors of the Indian Constitution, B. R. Ambedkar and Allah Krishna Sami. Around the same time, he founded and edited the Indian Yearbook of International Affairs, modeled on the British Yearbook of World Affairs, to which he was a frequent contributor. Alexander Ravis produced an essay for almost every issue of the Indian Yearbook. As an editor, he solicited contributions to leading figures from India and abroad, among them Barber and Bernard Gusel, etc. Alexander Ravis was amazed by the wealth of materials in India. His student and the successor at the University of Madras, the Indian jurist, his Rama Rao, recall Alexander Ravis, responded creatively to the wealth of materials available in Indian archives as well as to the relative absence of the standard works in contemporary European international law with which he had been accommodated to work. When he retired from the University of Madras in the year 1921, two of them have nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of his historical researches on the treaty and diplomatic relation between European powers. After a decade teaching in India, Alexander Ravis left Madras in 1921. In August that year, he moved to Australia and to post an associate professor of international legal organization at the University of Madras, the University of Sydney. Throughout the rest of his career, the Alexander Ravis used historical arguments to establish the legal equality of states that had been denied both under colonialism and under the post-colonial legal order. Alexander Ravis focused his attention on law and not politics. He believed in path of peace and preferred an international society the relations. It not, would not be fair if we do not talk about the Alexander Ravis when we talk about the evocation of international. I am very elated to share about him from the place that was led by him in the beginning. Thank you, Maharashtra National Law University in Mumbai for this I extend my sincere thanks to Vice Chancellor of Maharashtra National Dr. Tindili, and I extend my sincere thanks to Professor Call and uh, my sincere thanks to Aditya and uh, to invite. Thank you, one and all. Thank you for your wonderful sharing uh, um, as a head of the Department of Madras, where uh, Dr. Alexander was the first head of the Department of Madras. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thanks a lot, sir. I would like to invite Manoj Kumar sir for his uh, ending comments. Thank you very much, Aman, and uh, thank you very much, Professor Carl, for uh, 
a detailed, exhaustive, and very interesting presentation, which I heard after a long time. I, I had an opportunity to work with the many Indian international law professor, Professor R. Payanan, Professor Amtullah Khan, Professor Mani, and Professor Chimney. But I never had an opportunity to know so closely and so deeper the way you have explained in the uh, about the contribution of Alexander Witch and uh, uh, so that's a very wonderful uh, taking note of the Aditya's point and I agree with Professor Carl what Professor is not the uh, Indians have ignored Indian scholarship have ignored uh, because India is like a growth of international law actually has taken place much later and uh, we have started even the Indian Society of International Law in 1959 that is the almost in the end of like you know his stint in the madras university but he was always referred by the because in india very few centers uh, where the students got an opportunity to learn in international law particularly in 70s 80s or 90s and that was just like you know durai. there are a lot of indian scholars which we might have been durai is the great international relations professor and he started with the institute of uh, uh, world Affairs in the uh, Sapru House. That is the beginning. And then later on, Institute of International Affairs converted in the School of International Legal Studies in the Jawaharlal Nehru University in 1983-84. So our late, little bit late. But even I have quoted Alexander Witch in the article which I have published in Hinduism and International Humanitarian Law in 2005. I have today also seen Professor R.P. Anand in Asia and international law, he also cited Professor Alexander Witt. So it's a bit like, you no, know, if you look into the Indian scholars, they have cited because they know there are a lot of, even Professor Baxi cited, and I just, I will tell you the one story, Professor, but so when he's a Cotillias, like, you know, he, he Cotillias, he like uh, Alexander Witt wrote, and that time Professor Baxi met him uh, in uh, Sydney and, uh, I'll just read out, and that will be very interesting. And he mentioned, uh, so you know, Charles wrote a marvelous paper on the principle of dynastic debilitio invoking Cotillia theory of Mandela. And then Professor Baxi, I wrote a very long comment, which while agreeing in the main with his thesis, logically analyzed that concept. Now he told same thing to the professor uh, Alexander Witt, and then what uh, uh, Baxi writes: instead of joining issues with me, they said he contradict, and he made it clear that he did not like disagreements and public comments. He said he did not like disagreements and public comments. Full stop. And then he says he even implied sternly that he did not encourage public disagreement by a relatively junior scholar. So Professor Baxi was the junior scholar. Uh, so uh, then Professor Baxi writes, maybe I read too many implications in his body language, I, body language, but out of respect for him, I never published the paper. So he never, I have that paper got earlier. So he, he wrote in the 73, 74, I think uh, 67, 60 that time. He never wrote uh, the paper, which was shared only with the seminar participant. So he mentioned, so there are a lot of scholars like, you no, know, they entered and engaged with his debate in the earlier also, and because of his aura, because of his personality, even in the contemporary scholars could not match. So he not only ventured in the international law, he also ventured in the domestic law, like a PK Tripathi or contemporary domestic law, or like, you know, constitutional law scholars in India. They did not like you know, acknowledge. I say that Indian scholars working in the constitutional law some way has not acknowledged his contribution in his contemporary period. However, international lawyers, we have very few number. I'm very happy that Aditya Amana and Professor Uke, you thought about this. And this is the way we can fill the gap. And I'm sure like Professor Carl, uh, Professor Carl and other people. And the most interesting, which I feel, and I will also buy, the book with the exercise which has been i'm lucky that i got a chance to hear jennifer pitts and david armitage so they have almost uh, 28 papers good papers of the in four parts they have covered so this book we like we buy and keep in our library i'm sure that entire perspective of the in a brief 
can be assessed and understood by the students and India scholars. So the, the concern which you have expressed, I'm sure young generation will take it further. And after some time, Alexandra, which will be more frequently referred to by the Indian scholars as well. Thank you very much, Aditya. Over to Amant. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for your comments. I, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and the entire family of Maharaj National University, extend a hearty vote of thanks to all the speakers for today's event. Professor Dr. Kumar, Manoj Kumar Sena, sir, Dr. Karl, Professor B. Venugopal, Dr. Jennifer Pitts, I thank you all for enlightening us. I also want to thank the participants for kindly accepting our invitation joining us today evening. This event would not have been possible without our supporting uh, partner, Viramantri Center for Peace, Justice, International Law, and our media partner, Bar and Bench. Finally, finally, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record hearty thanks to Aditya for conceptualizing this event and Gunjan Deshpande for helping us with the logistics. We are looking forward to have you for our upcoming lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much.